I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, maybe had some family come into town, or uh, maybe you went out of town and visited family, or maybe you just got some days off from school or work, but I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Um, this morning we're going to be talking a little bit about, um, it's already been mentioned, but really about a uh, personal mission site and, and what that means. Because if, if you're not uh, a regular attender of Hilltop, you probably have no idea what I just said. Um, and if you are a regular attender of Hilltop, you still may be confused about what I just said. And so, um, we're going to be looking into that this morning. But if you haven't noticed, um, the, the things we love have a way of shaping who we are. The things we love in life have a way of changing what our life looks like, right? Okay, like, like let's say I, I said I love In-N-Out Burgers, okay? And if I went every day and I acted upon that love, and I ate two, three, four In-N-Out Burgers every day, that would most likely start to change me in some <laughs> ways, right? It would, it would start to affect my health. I, maybe not, but most likely I would gain some weight. Right? That, that love of In-N-Out cheeseburgers could shape who I am. <laughs> kind of like, in a very literal way, right? <laughs> kind of like, also, you know, if, if I said I love surfing, that, that has a way of shaping what my life looks like. Because when I decide where I want to live, I, that love comes into play in that decision and say, well, I want to live on the coast of California rather than in the middle of Oklahoma. Right? That, that love of surfing has a way of kind of changing what my life looks like. Right? And we see this to a greater degree with the people we love in our lives. Right? We've already been introduced to her, but my fiance, Caitlin, I just got recently engaged. And when we were at Pepperine as seniors, I mean, if you know my fiance, you know that she loves, she likes to dance. Okay? She likes to dance to music in the car. She likes to dance with friends. Like, she just enjoys dancing. She has fun dancing. If you know me, I hate dancing. <laughs> I am the worst dancer. I feel so awkward when I dance. And so I, I, dancing is like the last thing I want to do at any given moment. But when we were dating, you know, at Pepper and I, we were seniors, and then they, they had this thing called Senior Ball, where all the seniors go to this fancy place in Los Angeles, and there's music and food. And normally I would not have even shown up to a thing like that, but because I was dating Caitlin, she wanted me to go. And she went, and we went with a bunch of friends, and she wanted to dance. She wanted me to dance with her at this senior ball. And so because of my love for her, I danced for what seemed like a week. It was probably like an hour. <laughs> but my love for her shaped who I was that evening. If I hadn't loved her, I would have been like, you are not getting me to go to that senior ball. Definitely not out on the dance floor. But because I loved her, I was like, okay, fine, I'll bite the bullet and work through this for an hour. <laughs> see, our, our love has a way of shaping who we are, changing our lives. We can see this in stories, right? All the way back to like Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. Their, their love for each other was so strong they claimed they couldn't live without each other. And so that love caused them to kill themselves, right? That love shaped their lives in a quite dramatic way. We see this in movies all the time, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna steer clear of the Meg Ryan chick flicks because I don't want to really talk about those love stories, but I'm sure you have a lot of them in your head. I'm gonna stick to a more manly example of love in a movie. I'm gonna talk about Braveheart, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, Braveheart. He, he, William Wallace marries his bride in secret, and then she gets killed by this English tyrant, and because of his love for her. Her death drives him, compels him, motivates him to become this military revolutionary leader that leads this revolt against an English tyrant. See, and her love, his love for her caused him to become that person. He didn't want to become that person. He says over and over, he, he just wants to have a quiet farm with a family, settle down and be a peaceful man. But because of his love for his bride and because of her death, it shapes his life in a very dramatic way way where he becomes this leader that he would never have become if he didn't love his wife. If he didn't love his wife when she died, he would have been, would have been sad and be like, okay, well, I guess I'll find somebody else to settle down with. No, but because of his intense love for her, it drove him 
to seek justice, to seek vengeance, to seek freedom for his people. You see, love, the things we love in life, whether we realize it or not, have a way of shaping what our lives look like, have a way of changing who we are. But when it comes to the greatest love of all times, I don't think we let that love shape us the way that it was supposed to. I don't think we let that love change us in the way that it was intended to change us. We all know what love I'm talking about, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. See, it's the greatest love story of all time. It's, a, it's the story of the king who loved his people so much, and yet his people didn't love him. And his people rebelled against him and left his kingdom. And this broke the king's heart when this happened, because he knew that unless his people were in his kingdom, they would die. And so he watches his people leave him and walk into death and destruction, and it breaks his heart. And so as they are doing this, he takes his only son, his perfect son, his righteous son, and he kills his son while the people are still rebelling against him just so that they can have a chance, an opportunity to turn around and come back into the kingdom. It's the greatest love story that you will ever hear. Hollywood will never be able to pop it. And above it all, it's a true story. But I don't think we let that love, that intense love that Christ has for us, change us in the ways that Christ wants it to change us. Open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have a Bible, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because here, Paul is kind of describing how this love was intended to change our lives. He, he talks in this text, I'm going to start in verse 14. He talks in this text kind of describing what life should look like once we have been wrapped up and captivated by this love and we allow this love to shape us dramatically. Okay, so I'm going to start in verse 14. Paul says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, you see how, how this love is supposed to change us so radically that like before Christ, it's as if we had an old person. And after Christ, it's like we're a completely new person. We are a completely different person. We are changed. We are so changed in such a way that when we look at people, we don't see them from a worldly perspective anymore. We don't see them from the, the worldly things they have, we see them for the eternal beings they truly are. It changes our perspective. It's like scales fall off of our eyes and we can all of a sudden see reality as reality truly is, where we are living in this love story of a king that has sacrificed his only son, and we've had a chance that we didn't deserve to come back into his kingdom, and there are still people walking away that don't know about it. This love should change us. This love should compel us, Paul says. So that all of a sudden, we are no longer just people living here. We are actually ambassadors of the king of the universe. That we are speaking on behalf of the king to the people in this world who are still lost. We are given the task of reconciling the world back to God. We are given by God the ministry of reconciliation. Of showing the world the face of Christ. 
And so the thing is, we need to be changed by this love. We're never going to live the life that we were supposed to live. We're never going to feel fulfilled, complete, whole, until we allow this story, this love, to change us, to shape us more than any other love in our life. And see, we need this, okay? You need this. I need this transformation more than anything else in the world. But you know what? The people in your life need you to be transformed by Christ just as much. Because if we are transformed by Christ, Paul says they won't see the face of Christ. They won't get the message of reconciliation unless it is being spoken through us. Now, of course, God can save anybody he wants to, despite us. But in this text, Paul is saying, look, we have been given this ministry of reconciliation. We, it is as if we are ambassadors for Christ, and God is making his appeal through us to the world. And so if we are shining, if we are transformed by this love, if we are showing this love to the people in our lives who are lost, then they may not see the face of Christ. They may not ever hear about this reconciliation that is offered to them freely. The people in your life need you to be shaped by this just as much as you need to be shaped by this love. This last week I was with my family for Thanksgiving and uh, we, we watched this movie called Sharknado. Okay. Maybe, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Um, it wasn't in theaters, it wasn't a big time movie, it was just made for TV, it was on the sci-fi channel, um, and it is a very low budget, poorly written, poorly acted movie. It is comical how low quality this movie is. Okay, but, but if you know nothing about Sharknado, you can probably piece it together from the title, but it's about this massive storm that is in the Pacific Ocean, okay? and it's, it's barreling towards California. And, and it's like a hurricane-sized storm, and it's driving all the sharks in the Pacific Ocean towards the California coast. And so when the storm hits Los Angeles, there's massive flooding, and, and the streets are flooded and everything, and with the flooding, the sharks magically get washed up into Los Angeles as well with the floods, okay? So all of a sudden, there are people rocking around on the 405, and there's a tiger shark swimming in the carpool lane, eating people, okay? And there are people with sharks in their pools and sharks in their neighborhoods, and it's like, these sharks are everywhere. And it's absolutely insane. And then, to top it all off, this storm brings with it tornadoes. Okay, so tornadoes rip through Los Angeles, because we get those very often. And it picks up water. These tornadoes pick up the water as they go through Los Angeles. And with the water, they pick up sharks. So all of a sudden, you have sharks flying around the sky of Los Angeles, falling out of the sky and eating people in their swimming pools, in their streets, everywhere. It's just Los Angeles is overrun with sharks. And that's where you get a shark native. Tornado with sharks in it. And so we watched this movie, okay? It's absolutely ridiculous. It was funny. But the main character, his name is Finn, ironically. Um, his name is Finn, and he... He owns a bar in Santa Monica on the beach, and throughout the whole movie, it's interesting that Finn recognizes the danger that Los Angeles is in, okay? Finn sees the storm coming. Finn knows that these people are in danger, but everyone else doesn't seem to get the danger. They don't seem to understand that there are sharks coming. And so Finn, to start off the movie, he closes his bar down and he tells everybody to go home. He's like, you gotta go home, go get to high ground, like, it's the, the storm's coming, and everyone's like, what are you talking about? You're freaking out, it's not that big of a deal. And so he leaves, and he goes to get his family, and he's trying to communicate to people all along the way, like, the storm's coming, like, this is gonna be trouble, this is gonna be big, you gotta get to safety, and people don't believe him. And then he gets to his family to pick up his, you know, two kids, and his kids are like, why are you freaking out, Dad? It's just a little rain. Everyone in Los Angeles freaks out when we get a quarter inch of rain, which is, more true than not, but but his kids don't see the danger. And his the dad, Finn, he goes, no, no, you don't understand. There is flooding. There are sharks on the freeways. There are tornadoes coming, and there are sharks flying around the sky. And right on cue, 
Like, just to show you how bad this movie is, a shark comes plowing through the window and eats one of them. You know, and, and, and you're like, what? What just happened? But the whole movie, Finn is trying to communicate the danger to the people around him, and the people around him don't seem to get it. They don't see the danger there. And it struck my dad watching this movie. He said, you know, that's exactly the position that we're in. Right? We see the danger of people around us living without God. Not just the danger of once they die, they're in danger of going to hell. That's not the danger. The danger is living life, facing tomorrow without God in your life. People think that they're going to be okay without Christ. People think they can go about this life and they'll be fine and they can weather the storms without Christ in their life. And we can see the danger. They don't see it. But we do. We say, no, you don't see the massive great white that's flying down your swimming pool. You're in danger of living life without Christ. And we can see that and they can. We are exactly like Finn. We've been given this task, this ministry of showing Christ to the world, of showing people the danger that they are in. We have been given this ministry of being the face of Christ to the world. And so those people, if they don't hear it from you, if they don't see Christ's love in your life, they may never know the danger they are in. Because the scales have fallen off of our eyes. We can see reality. We are familiar with this love story. But the people in your lives, they don't know it. They haven't heard it. They haven't seen it change somebody's life for the better. They don't know the danger they are in living life without Christ. And so the task of us here now is to be transformed as Paul is talking about. To be a new creation. To, be, to become ambassadors for Christ. Representations of God's love in this world. To shine out and to show people that, you know what, there is reconciliation and it has been bought for you. You don't have to do anything about it. You can just say yes and turn around and come back into this kingdom and live the life that you were supposed to live. Live the life that you were meant to live in the first place. And so just like the stupid movie of Sharknado, we need to communicate the danger that people are in in our lives. And if we aren't doing that intentionally, then they may not hear about it. And just like with William Wallace, as his love for his bride shaped him and changed him and determined what his life would look like, this love, this relationship needs to shape and change everything we do from here on out. So much so that we become a new person. Someone who is just radiating the love of Christ to everyone we come into contact with in such a way that they can see that their lives are lacking something. That they are missing Christ and that they need him in their lives. That's what personal mission site is all about. That's what personal mission site is all about. It's, it's being intentional about being this representation of Christ for the people in your life who don't recognize the danger that they are in of living without Christ. And so the thing to think about over this next week, over this holiday season is how am I being a representation of Christ's love for the people in my life. How are you showing, how are you showing Christ to the world? How are you living out this ministry of reconciliation that Paul that Paul talks about? Um, okay. All right. How how are you being who Christ calls you to be? Being changed, becoming that person that can show Christ to the world. To think about that and to think about the people in your life that need to hear about Christ. That need to hear about his love and his reconciliation. Because God may have put those people in your life for the exact reason for you to show them that Christ loved them. And that Christ wants them to be in a relationship with them. And so think about that. Pray about that. Ask God to open up your heart and see the people that he is putting in your life to reach out to and to become 
the face of Christ for those people and for ourselves. Because the cool thing is the more we start shining out, the more we start reaching out to the people who don't know Christ, the more fulfilling, the more complete, the more whole we are going to be. And so think about that. Pray about that. As we go about, as we finish this year, as we go into a new year, think about how am I allowing Christ's love to shape my life? And how am I being shaped in such a way that people in my life can see that love in a tangible way and it will communicate to them the danger that they are in of living without Christ? Only you can answer that question for yourself. I can't, I can't tell you about it. You've got to work that out for yourself. And you've got to allow your life to be shaped and changed by this love. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for Thanksgiving and holiday season. I thank you for breaks off of work and school and time to be with family and friends. God, I thank you most of all for this incredible love story and this incredible love that has been given to us and we don't deserve it. God, I pray that you would help us to be shaped by this love. Help us to continue to let this love change who we are and change what our lives look like. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts and our eyes to see those people in our lives who, who don't recognize the lack that, that, that they are missing Christ. I pray that you would help us to recognize those people who don't know the danger that they are in of living without Christ. And I pray that we would be like Finn and Sharknado, that, that we would communicate through our love and through our lives the fact that these people need Christ. God, I pray that you would help us to shine out and be the ambassadors that you have called us to be. And that you would help us to live out this ministry of reconciliation to the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.